long before Santa Claus and long before Christmas. <coughs> Christmas wasn't Christmas, it was the winter solstice when the people in the northern hemisphere who can watch the sun and the days getting shorter and shorter. Suddenly in that day, the days be start becoming longer. And so they, they celebrate they, this as like the rebirth of the sun. <coughs> but to them it wasn't just the rebirth of the sun, it was also the rebirth of the spirit. There are these questions that still remain unanswered. What is the relationship between our electromagnetic field, our physical emanation, and the state of still presence? Or more profoundly or explicitly, what is the relationship between stillness and movement? What is it that makes you get up in the morning and do what you do? What is this Tao, Dharma, will of God, purpose of life? There are three stories that may help us to answer these questions. They pose questions in their own right. First is that old saying of one of the great Sufis who said, When I began my spiritual journey, I learned that which was acceptable to ordinary men, and that which I learned was repentance. And then I moved into the next phase of my spiritual journey and I learned that which was acceptable to ordinary men and to the elite. And that which I learned was faith and trust in God. And now I've moved into the third phase of my spiritual journey and I've learned that which is neither acceptable to ordinary men, nor to the elite, and as such I have become an outcast, a pariah, and that which I have learned is. What is that which we have learned in this place? How would you complete this phrase, and that which I have learned is. On Thursday, a little story was told, a Sufi story, about a wandering wise man who traveled from place to place, village to village, and in those places he was given food by the villagers. And he would often give advice or tell a story. They would also give him perhaps a piece of rag to place on his patchwork cloak. One day he was sitting resting under a tree when a simple man came along and sat down beside him after giving the necessary greetings. And after a while, the master said to the simple man, Have you eaten? Would you like to share my dates with me? After which the simple man said to the old wise man, I have no one. I have nowhere to go. May I share the journey with you? 
the old wise man said. I have nothing to give, but you're welcome to stay with me as long as you like. So they travelled very amicably together for some time, and wherever they went, because the wise man was given food, the simple man was given food also. But then one day, as they were walking along the road, the simple man picked up a piece of wood, and he turned to the wise man and he said, Master, I know that you love to whittle with your very sharp knife, and here is a fine piece of wood. What will you make with it? The wise man looked at him and said, Peace, my son, something will be suggested. Everywhere they went, the people asked, What are you whittling? And the old wise man would give the same response. Something will be suggested. And then one day, when they were sitting at a coffee table, sipping sweet, thick, creamed coffee, and the master was whittling away, the simple man said, You've almost whittled away this piece of wood. What is it that you're making? It had now become an exquisite little round, about as big as a date. The wise man said, Patience, my son, something will be suggested. And at that very moment, a woman came by carrying a screaming baby with a large basket of fruit on her head, obviously going to market. But she was sweating and agitated, obviously, with her child. Just as they were passing, the master rose up and stopped her in her tracks and said, I have something that may help you. And he popped the tiny piece of whittled wood the size of a date into the child's mouth. It immediately began to suckle. It was quiet and peaceful. And the mother went on her way. The wise man turned to the simple man and said, You see, my son, unbeknownst to me, I was whittling a baby's comforter. In a time long ago, there was an old farmer who every day arose giving thanks for the beauties of life. He toiled in the fields for years and years. Sometimes he reaped a fine harvest and sometimes they were lean times. But he was forever grateful and forever joyful. One day, when he was out hoeing his field, and the sun came high in the sky, and he needed to rest, he sat down under a tree, and as he was basking in the corners of the shade it provided, he looked up, and there was the most magnificent apple he had ever seen. It was large and red and shiny. He raised his arm, and just at a very touch, the apple fell into his hand. He looked at its perfection. He couldn't wait to return to his wife and daughter to show her this amazing evidence of the wonders of life. When he returned to his house, he put it in the middle of the table. When his wife and daughter came in, 
he proudly showed them this beautiful fruit. The wife was very impressed and said, yes, she'd never seen an apple so large and so beautiful. The daughter said, oh, this is a very great blessing from God. So the old farmer said, here, my daughter, you take the apple. She said, oh, no, no, I cannot. This apple is fit for a king. And the old farmer had a thought, yes, yes, it is. I'm going to give it to the king. And taking a little flask of water and a few crusts of bread, he wrapped the apple carefully in a soft, clean cloth and went his way to the palace of the king. The journey was long and he was sweating. The flies buzzed around his head, but he noticed none of these. He was filled with the joy of being able to give a gift to the king. When he got to the palace gates, the guard stopped him and said, You can't enter here. But he said, I, I have a gift for the king. But of course the guards, seeing his simple farmhand clothing, were reluctant to admit him. He told his story that he had this wonderful gift, he even opened and showed it to them. But finally they called their commander and when he heard the story from the farmer he was touched by his sincerity and so he personally escorted the farmer into the presence of the king. But before they got there walking down the long passageway the farmer was so overwhelmed with the thought of giving this wonderful, wonderful piece of fruit to the monarch, that when he stood in front of the king, he babbled out without even thinking, I, I just wanted to give this to you because you've been such a good king, and, and it's the most beautiful apple that I've ever, 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 ever seen. Now this was not the protocol that was usually followed in front of the king, but the demeanor of the farmer and his sincerity made the king look, take notice. And when he was handled the apple, he admired it, called his queen, and they both acknowledged that this was the finest apple that they had ever seen. Now the king said to the farmer, such a wonderful gift deserves a gift in return. No, 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 said the farmer. I, I have no expectation of anything in return. The king said, oh no, such a gift requires a response. Did you walk here to my palace? Yes, said the farmer, and immediately the king called a courtier to him, whispered in his ear, and the very finest stallion in the king's stables was bought for the farmer to ride her. Of course, as soon as he departed, word spread like wildfire through the village that the king had given the farmer a magnificent stallion in exchange for an apple. So a very greedy merchant who heard this story said, well, if he can give an apple to the king and get a stallion, then if I take him a gift, he will surely give me gold and jewels. So the merchant chose the finest horse in his own stables and made his way to the palace. 
When he arrived there and said to the guards, I have a gift for the king. Of course, seeing him in his finery, they immediately let him enter. He was taken into the presence of the king. And the merchant said, Oh, I know that you were given a gift of an apple. And so I was inspired to bring a gift for myself. I bought you my finest horse. Thank you, said the king, not taking any notice, going back over what it was that he was doing when the merchant entered. Thank you, said the king. But the merchant stood there. Said, <coughs> what is it you're wanting? Said the king. Is it perhaps that you think that you deserve a gift in return? Well, 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 yes, said the merchant. And the king said, I have just the perfect gift for you. And he whispered in a courtier's ear. And he went off and bought a silver tray with a cloth over it. And when the cloth was taken away, there sat the apple in all its perfection. An apple? An apple? You're giving me an apple in place for my wonderful gift of my best horse? The king said, this is the most precious of gifts because how would you end this story? What are the words that you would say that came out of the king's mouth? This is the most perfect and best of gifts because. And how does this story relate to the wandering dervish and the Sufi master? How do we put these three together to have the possibility to answer all three of these questions. What is the relationship between movement, life, and stillness, selfless? What is it that makes us get up in the morning and do what we do? What is this purpose of life? This will of God. Neither of those cases was it in any way premeditated. You know, just unfolded in a natural um, way to the result compared to the manipulating and playing with his mind. <coughs> in this first saying of this great Sufi master, who is the completion of that? I have learned 
that which has made me an outcast of my that which I have learned. What happens to us when first of all we serve our ego doing all because we want aggrandizement or recognition then we serve people because again we need recognition and then we, we serve God but now all of those three are no longer so what is this? What is this that makes us get up in the morning and do what we do? It's not without purpose. Do we serve something? It's not our ego or people or God that makes us get up in the morning and do what we do. What is it then? What is it that allows us to whittle and not know what we're whittling until the moment? That's it. And yet we look, we look and we look, and we find ourselves in this place. Because when stillness and movement meet, we cancel each other out. We can't find ourselves in the stillness, nor in the movement. And when they come together here, Is this a conundrum, a paradox? Certainly not. We know it's real. We pinch ourselves when it's still real. seeing on the brows scrunching. Just a sign that it's all happening in the mind. It has to be happening somewhere else. Then. We answer that final line. This is the most perfect gift because you might give us a clue. What would you answer to? Everything. Everything. Huh? There's nothing left. Passion. Everything you have. Whether it be a simple apple or, or a fine horse. I mean, the apple to him was everything. The horse was nothing to the merchant.